I'm here with James Heisig. All the people that try to learn Japanese nowadays uh, know the Heisig method. <laughs> Oh, there is a book that was written in so many languages that oh, there is just a work that uh, he makes in his free time. <laughs> Because to learn, his, uh, his own work, he's the, the person that was responsible to have this first book of Japanese philosophy now in Spanish. Uh, when I see this book in Spanish, um, the first book that I read for you was Philosophers de la Nada. And there was my introduction to Japanese philosophy. Can you tell us a little bit about your history and, and what you, because you are from USA, have a lot in Mexico and Spain and then Japan. Uh, what, what come this, this, this contest? Oh, um, that's a big question, but basically I was invited to Japan 40 years ago to help begin an institute for dialogue among philosophies and religions east and west and that's where I've been it's been a, a dream a dream life very little teaching only in the graduate school with an excellent team of scholars in our own building and people coming from all over the world and I began Japanese philosophy only after going to Japan um, at first I didn't find it very interesting um, eventually, I got deeper into it. But um, the problem was that um, philosophy was defined and the word was invented at a time when Japan was opening to the West. So it was defined as a Western pursuit. And it was kept at arm's length, at a distance from the culture, critique of the culture, and the everyday lives and values of Japan. It was an object of study, like studying history, but studying living history in order to understand the West. And this always seemed wrong to me, because philosophy is by nature universal. And if it has something universal to say, then the Japanese, who are, even if they're studying Western philosophy, should have something universal to hear from it and a contribution to make. But it had become a field of specialization. And the people my age, like John Moraldo and, and Tom Kasulis, who were studying Japanese philosophy in the 20th century, felt the same way. We have to open this up. Philosophy didn't begin with people who started reading Western philosophy. It has to be much older than this. So we had this idea about 30 years ago to put together a source book of Japanese philosophy. Um, uh, a book of sources and how do we define philosophy where does it begin where does it end so we began in about 2004 we had a meeting at the university at our institute in Nansan and we brought together people from the French Spanish English Chinese Italian and German um, language groups to talk about the study of Japanese philosophy in their language circle and it's interesting, we had about 30 people there at the conference. While it was going on, the Japanese Philosophical Association was meeting on another part of campus. And all of their presentations were about Descartes and Hegel and Kant and Aristotle and so forth, all of them. This was the Japanese Philosophical Association. And all of our presentations were about everything from the ninth century onward about Japan. So you see the split. Um, it was out of that meeting that we finally decided let's begin with a project of a source book. So we had to draw on experts from all over the world. We ran seminars to bring experts in, decide what to include, what not to include, how much to include. Um, but the, the main point is it's not just this book. It's the process of creating the book that's much more important. So when we began in 2004 with the idea of making this book. If you said Japanese philosophy in the West, they thought the Nishida and Tanabe and Nishitani, they thought this narrow circle. Now, people think of, as well as Kukai and, and Dogen, yeah? they think of the Neo-Confucians, they think of um, uh, Tokugawa writers and so. And so it's much bigger. I'm not saying the source book created that environment, 
but it was in the same zeitgeist. It, it, it grew out of the same feeling that um, Japanese philosophy is much older, much richer, and what Japan has yet to realize, more universal than they know. Um, you see, Japan is an island, and as an island, the idea that its values, that didn't colonize other countries, the idea that its values should be applicable to another civilization would create principles that transcend their culture and the culture they're colonizing. Huh? Well, uh, c countries like England, countries like Holland, you know, the United States, all, they've all been great colonial powers, right? The, yeah, they, they functioned because they knew something about principles that transcend their own culture. Of course, they thought there were universal principles, they're very particular, but the point is, they were able to think in these universal terms politically, economically, and philosophically. Japan never has. It had no reason for these transcendental higher principles. It had no reason to create a thought system that was meant for consumption in Brazil or meant for consumption in France. It was ours. So when they would read a universal philosophy, it would come in, they would take it and read it and say, well, that's very interesting, but it's not quite universal because it doesn't work in Japan. So they would make a few changes, and then it becomes theirs. Huh? So instead of saying it's not universal because it doesn't work in Japan, therefore we make it universal and send it back to its country of origin, they kept it with their own changes. Huh? That's the problem that we had with philosophy. And philosophy was not universal enough. But when we begin to look at the long history of philosophy, there are plenty of thought systems and structures and ideas that can be applied to problems today and be applied to um, uh, problems in intellectual history and so forth. And that mood was the mood out of which the source book was, was made. And we decided after completing the English that it should be done in the second language of the Western Hemisphere into Spanish. And we gathered together a group of people five, uh, four years ago and finally, the, uh, a couple of months ago, the book, the book came out, so. Yeah, very nice. Thank you for the book. There is an interesting statement that we can all make some links with your talk here. Uh -huh. uh, I want to hear about you, uh, about this concept uh, about cultural disarmament. Ah. Because you, are, you, you, you heard the round table. Mm. You were what uh, Heinhard and, and John and another one said. Somehow, all they were skeptical, skeptical mm. with this uh, cultural disarmament. And I know uh, that's the name come from you. <laughs> <laughs> but you all, and that, um, I think there is some kind of ambiguous when you say you try to make philosophy universal. Uh, in some way can say globalization, colonization, imperialism. In another way, can say liberation. When, when you say cultural disarmament, I can think like John says, yeah. there is disarm the only weapons that the resistance yeah. have. And there is not, not, not nice. Or, the, that was my question for you, you want to take down this yapery that Kutur have. Yes. How you say this ambiguity? Um, I think part of the problem is that uh, cultural disarmament was taken to mean deculturizing. So if you have a philosophy that's steeped in the culture of one country, you have to get rid of that culture so it can become universal. That's the last thing I mean. What I mean is that every culture <clears throat> in addition to enhancing the life of its people, and in addition to having something to offer to the culture of its neighbors and the rest of the world, every culture has its own unique way of oppressing its own people and of inflicting its ideas and its problems on other cultures, okay? Now, in the case of philosophy, the idea that <clears throat> the particulars of philosophies that were born and nurtured in the Mediterranean basin, the idea that those particular philosophies should be treated as universal and define philosophy for the rest of the world, what belongs to philosophy and what doesn't, 
That's using uh, culture as a weapon. Yeah? It's not um, the, the sword of the conquista. It's not the sewing machines and the bicycles and the technologies of the 19th century missionaries used as the weapon to convert people to Christianity. But it's the weapon, weaponry of um, supposedly the only universal ideas. And the rest of ideas are particular, ours are universal. No, they are particular ideas that should be shared in a common space. They are not meant to bring conformity to the definition. So when you take the universal to mean conformity with your own particular situation, then culture becomes a weapon. That's what we have to disarm to get rid of that part. You don't get rid of culture by disarming it. You get rid of aggressive culture. You get rid of a closed culture, naive culture. That's the part we want to get rid of. And that seems to me the fundamental function of philosophy. Not just to purify the mind of individuals through logical thinking and reason, huh? but to purify culture of its unconscious weaponry, the way in which it inflicts its ideas on, on other people. Yeah, that's my idea. Yes, uh, and I probably should have explained it more clearly <laughs> to. Uh, no, you those you explained right? it nicely in lecture. That, that, yeah, that's yeah. so nice. But I, that's so nice because all the round table don't know uh, where they come. <laughs> now they they come to this. What does mean? Because we, in, in a way we can read it. Is maybe you want to do just analytical philosophy? Oh yes. Oh my. That 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 that, that sounds like our oh, tool because oh. then we have this uh, analytical philosophy, continental philosophy, on oh. analytical philosophy is oh. desirable cultural. You need it to, you you can hear that. Yeah. But uh, maybe just yes, a little bit of, of free. Né? You you say about conquista and this cultural desire problem. Né? And can you see the problem with uh, the disputa between Las Casas? and Sepulveda, uh -huh. how, uh, if you try to use your concept for cultural yes. disarmament yeah. in this situation? Yes, I think actually the, the primary model for, for my idea of disarmament was um, um, the cultural disarmament of theology. That's where it began. Um, the idea that um, the universal means the uniform which is the, found, the foundation of, um, of much of the mission, much of Christian theology, how it functions around the world. So actually, it's this situation. So in, in the case of Sepulveda in, in Casas, de la Casas, you have um, a theological agenda mixed in with a political one. So that would be, yeah. And I think theology has its own leyenda negra. <laughs> I mean, and, and so does philosophy. And I think the indication of that is what's happened to philosophy in Japan. When philosophy uh, arrived in Japan as a discipline, two interesting things happened. First of all, the libraries took over the, I don't know if you've heard of it, a thing called the Dewey Decimal System. It was um, a system invented, I think, in the U of Chicago, but to how to catalog books. And they took the Dewey Decimal System and they revised it in the section called philosophy, and they had Asian philosophies, or Western philosophies, and Eastern philosophies. And under Eastern philosophies, they distinguished between China and Japan and Korea. And when the University of Tokyo be began to introduce philosophy, they took over this same model into their curriculum. But by the time you get to 1960, oh, well before that, but just to begin then, when you went into a bookstore and you looked at philosophy, it was all, uh, from Aristotle to, to Heidegger, it was all Western. And all Oriental thought, whether it's Korean or Japanese, Chinese, of any kind, was called shiso, thought, ponzi. They separated. Now, if you go into the um, bookstores, Japanese philosophy is, of modern thinkers are mixed in with Western. Um, but, the philosophy is disappearing from the curricula, so the people who want to teach Japanese philosophy end up teaching it in, you don't have Asian studies in Asia, no, they end up teaching it in departments where it really doesn't quite belong, and departments of philosophy are being absorbed, and religion are being absorbed into general humanities, intellectual history. So 
many of the young people coming up get the idea that philosophy is a philology of texts, or it's the study of the development of a history of ideas. And the philosophy is not um, grappling with human experience or with the fundamental problems that face the earth. Um, the philosophy is a discipline, a specialization. Um, that, that you can, This is the big problem. And opening philosophy to include the great transformative traditions like Buddhism and Confucianism, um, as well as the more uh, uh, epistemological and logical and uh, metaphysical aspects of philosophy, is a direct resistance to what's happening in the education system in, in Japan today. Yeah. I know you're asking questions, and I'm answering different questions, but... Uh. No, there, there is very nice. Uh, that's nice because you say uh, theology, then uh, I not say this word first, uh, you say it. <laughs> then um, I have... Um, oh, the first question is more personal. Uh, what is the relationship with the, the church? What is the relationship be between the Nazan Institute and the church? Um, we have no direct relation to the church. We take no money from the... The Nanzan is a, a, um, a Catholic university in the sense that it was founded by Catholic missionaries. But um, the percentage of students is not m much... of Catholic students is not much higher than the national average. And uh, in Nanzan, we don't allow any proselytizing, any evangelization on campus of any religion, whether it's uh, one of Japan's new religions or traditional traditions or Christianity. It's, it's an absolutely open campus. And um, it's interesting. When the Religion and Culture Institute was founded, um, the university didn't see the need for it because they said, look, we don't have a department of philosophy we don't even have a department of religious studies. And the theology program is only undergraduate. We don't even have an MA and PhD program. So to begin an institute to study philosophy and religion is like beginning a building with the roof. <laughs> we don't have the foundations. So the president said, okay, give me a corner of the campus. I will build a building there. And we will be an independent part of the school corporation. And that's what happened. But then I came from, uh, I was actually before coming to the institute, immediately before, I was living in Solentiname with Ernesto Cardinal and the Sandinistas. There were two groups of Sandinistas, those who were collecting arms over in San Juan del Rio and, and the tip of the island of Macaron, there was a group of poets and artists and so forth who lived. And I was living there for a while before coming to, to. But each of us who came to the Institute brought their own, the Japanese as well as uh, Jan van Brach, the Belgian, brought our own context to the Institute. So in the first year, um, Fritz Buri, the great um, demythologist from Basel came, the theologian, uh, he walked by the theology faculty, by the philosophy faculty, and came and stayed with us. And then in came uh, Hans Küng, and he stayed with us. And then in came the whole, Sandi not whole, uh, four members of the Sandinista government. <laughs> and, and they stayed with us for a while. Huh? And then my friends from Spain, like Raimundo Panikar. And then my old friend from my youth, Ivan Illich, came and stayed with us. And Wilford Cantwell Smith. And, um, uh, well... I, I can't begin to name all the people, begin to come. And we were so why are they coming to us? It, we, without wanting it, we became a symbol for this, this dialogue among cult, uh, philosophies and religions. And so after two and a half years, three years, the university said, will you please join the university? <laughs> and we said, okay, but on our conditions. We don't ever teach more than two periods a week. Everybody in the staff comes every day. We give you all the money we've raised, but you have to pay for our secretaries and our library. And they said, okay. Uh, and th that's how it continued to work. So we have an open, um, an open institute that it, everybody's teaching, but there are no credits and no courses. If you have an essay and you want to... Uh, there is, does sound like the, this dream from Humboldt. <laughs> from, from a really uh, university, but 
there is what you you heard about NASA Institute now about this freedom about this speciality for, for me all special about this uh, way to deal with hierarchical things as normal ah, um, yeah, yeah. and I think that's very nice the I just heard the good things about there and uh, that was Takeshi was there well what, what's really great for me is it's an ongoing education I'm surrounded by superior people Everything I know, there is someone around me who knows more about it, probably. Um, the four permanent members, as well as the postdoctoral students and the other visitors who come. It's a team of scholars. And five minutes away, we have a commune where we live a uh, simple life together. So it's, it's, um, it's been a kind of dream. Yes, yeah, yeah. And for example, let me, let me give you an idea. Suppose you have a book that we're interested in about something to do with the dialogue between philosophies and religions, East and West. And the manuscript is finished, and you are ready to give it to a publisher. Yeah? If we are interested in publishing it with um, a mainline publisher, depending on the language and so on, but we have these contracts, we would pay for you to come to Japan and live with us for three to four months, and every chapter of your book open as a seminar and the people that can handle the, um, the language that you use would join the seminar, anybody who wants to. And you present your ideas, and people jump from all angles. But you must look at this, and you must look at this, and that's not right. And while you are with us, then you polish the work on the basis of the criticisms. And someone in the staff will check the footnotes. Someone will check the translations. And then you sit down with us and decide what kind of a typeface you want, how big you want the book to be, how you want it to look. So you are there when we are actually producing the book. We typeset all our own books. We do all the technical work ourselves. And then when the book comes out, I have the feeling, I, I look at the books the published in Lanzan and my fingerprints on all, my name isn't on all of them, but my fingerprints are there. You know, you, you've left your mark on it and you are part of the book and you learn from the author. It's one thing to pick up a book and read it. It's another thing to work with the author on it and know what he was trying to do and what his limits are and, and what his strengths are. So it's a constant education. And then what we do is when we publish the book, one third of the royalties come back to the institute. The two thirds go to the author. And that goes into a fund and that money is used to pay the next person to come for the next book. So we're always in, in that process of bringing scholars in and learning from them. So it isn't as if we are in an ivory tower uh, making pronouncements about how the world... That's what we do when we go abroad, you know. But when we're in Nanzan, we are all sitting at the feet of each other learning. Yeah. And for me, that has been the dream. <laughs> Adult education without end, yes. I think NASA is all, uh, a really nice example, maybe the only in the world, sadly the only in the world, and all for people that have really big difficulties with hierarchical problems between professor and the students and all, all of these things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just the idea we, we make philosophy not for money, you know? I, I don't yeah. someone that to make philosophy just to be rich. And we, we don't need so really the credits all this thing. You know, we, we, we want to, to stay together and, and make something together. And without often the work from NASA, uh, we don't exist with your conference. Now we but, are But one thing is I didn't answer your question. You asked about our relationship to the church. And yes. I told you we don't take any money from them, and then I went off somewhere. Well, there, was a, there was a question. Uh... <laughs> yeah, because... Um, <clears throat> um, we, the, the, once in a while, the bishops of Japan will ask us to do something, but maybe twice since I've been there. They asked me once to translate um, one of the documents of Vatican II into Japanese for a new edition of it. And let's see. Oh, and then the bishop of, uh, of Kyoto, who is in charge of dialogue, Bishop Tanaka, among religions of Japan, which the bishops don't do. They, they're not... They don't know about that. They're not interested in it. He wrote and asked me to fill out a form to send to Rome, which we were very happy to do. But, but uh, we haven't really had any direct problems or contact with Rome. 
once in a while they will come to visit us, but um, they have no idea <laughs> about these things. You see, the problem with the Vatican Council was it introduced the idea of dialoguing with the religions of the world. Okay? But what was the fundamental idea, novelty of Vatican II, was that the church is basically its people, not its hierarchy. Huh? The church is the people, and throughout the whole document, they talk of God's people, God's people, God's people everywhere. But it became very clear after the next two popes, after the death of John Paul I, it became very clear that the church wasn't even prepared, the hierarchy, to talk to its own people. The distance between the hierarchy, the authorities, and the ordinary people who were the foundation of the ideology of the Vatican II, they couldn't talk to them. So how are they going to talk to other religions? That's impossible. No. So in that sense, even though we were a center aimed at dialogue, um, we made it clear to the Vatican that we work at an intellectual level. We are not going to dialogue with church people or institutions or establishments. We're going to dialogue at the level of ideas. And so they have, um, no matter what we say, they pretty much left us alone that way. This is really nice to hear it. But I, I just give my example what I mean, the relationship with the church. Uh, maybe I just can really read it. I come from a poor family in Brazil and I, I really learn reading uh, with liberal theologians, uh, with this, this project that okay. we come to the church. My, my mother and, and we, we come from very simple, poor family and the schools were not good enough, but you have all these uh, comunidades ecclesiais yeah. de base yeah. Yeah. And, and this some like uh, autonom uh, communities yes. Yes. and read the Bible and try to discuss with another. I, when I, when I, I try to, to think about my childhood, I, I'm debt with this project because without this, I, I don't have so reading. Absolutely, absolutely. And when I, I think about uh, this debt, maybe there was because I'm, I'm come to philosophy. And when, when I know what they make with the liberal theology, hmm. And I, I see the liberal theology uh, now, the, the, the whole history, uh, science, Gustavo Gutierrez yes. and Leonardo Boff, there was the first time that we have really intercultural intellectuals yes. Yes. that they, they take the really serious what they make, they make the, uh, the best people from, from on they was total destroyed yes. from the Vatican. Yes. Absolutely, yes total destroy, then uh, they have no chance. I'm but they were also all, um, you talked about um, as a young boy going to this, these theologians were very much part of the ordinary life. Uh, Gutierrez, you know, works in, with very poor, simple people and, and Jan Sobrino, and the same thing originally with Boff. No, they worked with ordinary people. This is what... Uh, our yes, but then uh, I think they, they, they make the recept of... They make, they, there was intellectual, they, they, they can philosophy, there was really high intellectuals. Yes. And, and they, they lost, they was almost destroyed. I, I say destroyed because I have the, the possibility uh, to make a yes. little job in Brazil, to teach, to, to help in a priest seminar. Yes. And I want you all to discuss it. I, I, there, there is a fun job. <laughs> but uh, this is a priest seminar. They, they needed to, to take three years from philosophy and university. Yeah. I, I, I'm like a director of philosophy. That's, uh, that to me, just I help uh, all, all the students, all the, the seminaristas, Seminar, yeah. with uh, the problems uh, with the university. Uh, how you need to make a master of art and, uh, and thesis and yeah. these things. But I, from, from my perspective, I try to make another thing, a, a little bit more Kant, maybe a middle Schopenhauer, not Heidegger. Yeah, yeah. But they come the bishop and kick me out because they want just the scholastic, just the scholastic, yeah, just yeah. The scholastic, no talk, no discussion. They are priests, you pay this, just scholastic. We don't want people that come from outside and then I, I, I was kicked out. And but I, I, I judge to to explain yes. this this relationship because when I say Japan and then I say what happened with Brazil, but I say the, the Latin America, 
Now we have this, uh, there was the first that have all this contact with the indigenous people, all this thing, but they was high intellectuals and they come to the Vatican and they change the rules. Uh, they're not so much. And yes, we've, yeah. is we've had the same problem. Yeah. Um, when they began the Department of Theology, Pontifical, the Rome said, would the members of the Institute teach um, the theology of religions? Well, we didn't really know what theology of religions was 35 years ago, but then we found out gradually. And I went several times to the, the bishops, uh, once a cardinal, to the people in the Curia, and I told them, look, you want us to teach about other religions, what is true in other religions, and how to meet other religions. Eh? But you don't allow our students to study other religions. That's like teaching feminist thought, but not allowing the students to meet any women. <laughs> huh? Huh? I mean, we have experts in Shinto and in new religions and in various forms of Buddhism. The students should first learn about those, and then if they want to do a Christian hermeneutic, that's fine, but they should learn. And uh, it was consistently forbidden. So this is the problem we have even in Japan, where Christianity are like the, Christianity are like the, the the Hare Krishna of Recife, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> the, they're there, they're nice people, but they don't really have a great effect. Yes. Then another thing about, about Gustavo Gutierrez, um, about 20 years ago, I invited him to come to the Institute. And he came and he gave a, a very nice talk. And in the Catholic newspapers before that, they talked about theology at the end of a gun coming to Nanzan, you know. Really? These right-wing people were writing about it. So we had a very nice audience, mostly professors and uh, graduate students, a very big audience. And so I am there to translate and so on. And um, we began at about 4.30, and it was 8 o'clock, and I was the chair, and I said, no, now it's too late. Uh, maybe you want to go home um, because you have to eat and uh, have class tomorrow. So we will close here, but if there's one more question that somebody must ask, please ask. And one man uh, stood up, a German professor of theology, and he said, um, Father Gutierrez, what do you think about the way the Vatican treated you? And all the Japanese went, <gasps> You know, you, you, don't, you don't ask that question, you know, and they were looking down at their feet and shuffling their feet. It was like, no, don't you have any civility? How can you ask? But um, he said, uh, his answer was unbelievable. He said, I have always loved the church. Uh, I've always served the church. When they asked me to go to Europe to study, I went to Europe to study. And uh, when I came back, my idea was to change the church by serving it. I never took any profit from the church. I never got any gain. As far as I know, I have been a faithful servant of the church. And they treated me this way. It was not just inhuman, it was unchristian. They condemned me without allowing me to defend myself. They criticized books that they hadn't read. Even the Pope admitted to me, he said he had not read what he condemned. And they were allowed to spread their opinions about my work in the press, but I was condemned to be quiet. I had to sign a paper that I would keep silent. He said, this is not Christian. This, this is not the church. How could this happen to me that I have served the church? And everybody was so shocked that he was talking frankly. And he said, but, but, Sunday I will be back in Peru, and I will go to the little mountain church with the dirt floor, where I always go to church on Sunday. And in the front row will be seated, like every week, Maria and her four children. And the children will have shoes and a nice dress or a nice pair of trousers, a nice blazer. And Maria will wear the same dress she has worn for the last five years and no shoes. Yes. Yeah. Um, she has no husband and she works morning to night for the children. And then he said, and I'm translating phrase by phrase, and then he says, what I suffered at the hands of the Vatican compared to what Maria suffers every day, then a pause, 
No es nada. No es absolutamente nada, he said. Like this, he shouted, right? And there was the shock in the audience and then just thunderous applause. That's his Gutierrez. Huh? You see, what, what, a, what a great man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, of course, it's so <laughs> nice to, to hear this. this it, th that's happening now, then. Yeah, that's yeah. Happen something happening now. That, that, that was the, the thing that's a magical place there. And, but uh, this, this point is, uh, w you can understand when I heard something like disarming, cultural disarming. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sound like the Vatican, say, we need to oh. disarm the cultural, this, this cultural people. No? Yeah, they have a very different idea of it. Uh, give me a good example. I had a student, a classmate of mine in seminary, who came from the central highlands, the Chimbu people of New Guinea. And um, in the mass where it says the, the Lamb of God, huh? they compare Jesus to a lamb, right? Well, there are no sheep in New Guinea, no? So what is a sheep? It is a family, it's an animal that gives you wool and it gives you food and uh, um, you take care of them, you know, as to, in order to make a living. So they are an animal collect very closely related to the, to the community, right? So they said, what would be the equivalent in New Guinea? Well, the pig. The pigs live under the house. The mothers often even nurse the baby pigs if they're sick directly. They give food to them. They take care of all sorts of things. So, in the Mass, they begin to say, Pig of God. Yes. <laughs> huh? Which, yes, exactly. Uh, you laugh, and the Vatican got very angry at it, right? They said, you cannot do that. And they said, but we don't have any sheep, and the sheep doesn't mean anything yes. to us. The pig means this. Uh, does it have to be universal eh, in order to be right? Universal meaning conformity. Or can you have universal pluralism? Can the church be a common space where different cultures can do? That's disarming culture. Yeah? The Vatican's idea of disarming is taking away culture. My idea is taking away the weapons of culture. And the weapons of culture are in the hands of the powerful and the hierarchy. They're not in the hands of the Chimbu people of Central New Guinea. <laughs> James, I... Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Uh, if you have some last words or the, something oh. about your conference, uh, what do you think to stay with oh, us? Oh, this is, yeah, this, this is, um, the e, um, ENOJP is a great thing. I'm really happy with it, especially because the, I, I, I don't see uh, paternalism. You know, a young person comes up who's a PhD student and they give an idea and somebody says, well, actually, um, actually, you should go back and do your homework. You should read this and this and this. Like you're a teacher talking to a student. Everybody is treated as if they're equal scholars. And unlike so many philosophical communities, there isn't competition for available money for publication and so on. It's collaborative. Uh, how long will this last? I don't know. But for now, we should enjoy it because it's wonderful. You know? Yeah. Uh, this is this is a, a great little association, and our idea, as well as you know, is to help as best we can to get the publications of the students and professors available at, at cheap prices, so that people can be published and the ideas can go out. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.